Welcome to the last session of today in this tent. Um, I have the pleasure to uh, welcome Dennis Giese, a security researcher from Boston, who will talk to you um, about privacy leaks in smart devices extracting data from used smart home devices. The stage is yours. <clears throat> Yep, so thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for you to, to be here and uh, greetings to everyone on the live stream. So uh, today I want to talk about uh, privacy leaks in smart devices and in particular how to extract uh, data from uh, used uh, smart home devices. Um, the outline for the talk will be the following. First I start with the motivation. Um, then I um, will talk about which kind of data you can expect on IoT devices, how is it stored, um, what kind of reset states you can uh, expect if you have used uh, devices. And um, then I will talk about um, extraction methods, how to extract this data. In the last one, um, in the last point, I have like uh, some example cases uh, for some uh, devices um, um, which I analyzed. Some information about me. Um, I'm a PhD student right now at the Northeastern University in the US. So I arrived just yesterday from Boston. I'm working there with Professor Nobir. Um, but I'm also a grad student at the TU Darmstadt. I'm working there with Matthias Hollick from the Zemo Lab. And my main interests are uh, reverse engineering of uh, interesting devices, and this can be everything from IoT, smart locks, but also like, for example, physical locks. Um, some side notes about the talk. Um, I know I have given a lot of Xiaomi talks, but this talk won't be Xiaomi bashing talk, uh, because the uh, um, issues apply to all the vendors. Um, most of the vendors which I present here are already known um, and are widely used, but m most of the time for, for different use cases. Um, for legal and also ethical reasons, I had to censor most of the data, so you will still see like a lot of, that I kind of blanked a lot of data. Um, if you want to use the methods, um, then it's on your own risk. So if you destroy your uh, smart home device by unsoldering the uh, BGA chip and pull, pulling the pads, then it's your fault, not mine. Um, and at some point, I have to simplify a lot of things. For example, an end flash in particular is way more complex, but I have to simplify it there. Um, then the thing is how um, to interpret or to reassemble NAND data is also out of scope of this talk and also how to route device specific, uh, uh, or how to do device specific uh, routing methods um, are also out of scope. So let's talk about the motivation. Uh, in general, data on used hard drives is a very traditional problem. I mean, technically it existed forever, um, but this problem increased with platforms like eBay where people started to sell their used computers or used hard drives. Um, and most of the times, these computers contain still a lot of data, like personal information, emails, pictures, other media, or sensitive documents. And um, in the beginning of the 2000s, there have been like some uh, awareness raised by, um, by researchers. In this particular case, there's like a paper where people bought like um, 150 drives, I believe, and then analyzed what kind of information was still on the drives and tried different methods to erase them. Um, the same problem more or less affects also um, multifunction, uh, multi multifunction printers or lab instruments. And at some point, the NIST, uh, which is like the standardization organization in the US, uh, recognized that as a problem and uh, created a standard how to securely erase uh, devices. And one of the solutions was, for example, to wipe the hard drives, or if it's not possible, to just sell the devices without any hard drives and, uh, for example, shred the devices like here in one picture. Um, however, there's still like a, a lot of remaining problems. For example, um, there's like a lack of knowledge or awareness. Um, not every user knows like what kind of data is, uh, data is stored or how to delete the data correctly. Um, also, there's like people who say like, I don't have anything to hide, I have no inf inf important information. So they're totally careless and they just don't care. And the, the third case is if your device is broken and you cannot delete it securely anymore, um, then you have a problem, the data is still there. Um, you would think that this problem is not, nowadays um, not a big issue, but uh, it has shown, like in this, uh, this year actually in a study, um, that still 42% um, of the hard drives which you can buy from eBay uh, are still containing some kind of um, confidential information or sensitive information. Um, after hard drives, the next uh, interesting thing was um, smartphones, because smartphones are more or less sensitive data to go. And these phones most of the time contain sometimes even more um, sensitive information than hard drives. For example, pictures, messages, account credentials, or call lists. And uh, what m many people don't know, um, the device storages were not encrypted by default for a very long time. So for example, I, uh, Apple introduced in 2014 uh, with iOS 8 the uh, default encryption on, this, on, on iOS devices. And Android was uh, only in 2015 with uh, Android uh, version 6 
um, where they enabled the encryption. So for a very long time, it was not enabled. Um, another problem is that factory reset is not uh, done properly, and we have in, like a paper in 2015 which analyzed like this for Android devices, and we figured out that many many devices are still um, don't um, uh, still containing a lot of sensitive information and are not wiped correctly. And again here, um, the NIST addressed that with a standard in 2014 where we said like, okay, you need to do particular steps uh, for smartphones. So the next generation of problems is IoT, and IoT is everywhere. The problem with IoT in particular is, uh, in contrast to like smartphones or PCs, you don't have a real good uh, user interface, or like, you have no user interface at all. So you don't uh, can't access uh, the information on the device um, directly. You have no idea what kind of information is on the device, um, what information is collected in the first place, so, so you cannot access it directly. Um, which means, obviously, for a factory sets, if you do a factory set of an IoT device, you cannot fully verify that it's actually empty. And um, the implementation on how this uh, factory set is done is more or less um, depending on vendor to vendor, um, on version to version um, of like firmware, even for, for the same model. So it's like absolutely unclear. So about the motivation about this particular talk, why I have um, looked into that topic, was basically when I was doing my master thesis at Zemo um, and analyzed the security of um, IoT devices in general, my goal was all the time to, um, root, uh, to get root access at some point on the devices. So what I had to do is like, I had to do like, some attacks, then I had to reset the devices again, and then I had to redo the attacks again. Uh, and one, one thing which I figured out, every time I do a reset, there's still a lot of traces of data left on the device, and sometimes even all of the data was still available, which was at some point even for my research like a problem. So the other question is like, okay, where you would find used devices? And the thing, it's kind of easy. You just go to eBay or to Amazon warehouse deals, um, and you can order them directly there. Sometimes if you go to some flea markets, um, then you find like bunches of like old Alexa Echo dots, like first generation or something. Or just look in the trash. Um, sometimes your neighbors, if they have like broken light bulbs or something, they just throw it in the trash. Could be also interesting. Um, there's also like a tradition, I think, in many families that they give like old uh, devices to like um, families and friends, um, and here you get again like used devices. And at some point, obviously, you have used devices in your home. Why is this important? Well, um, it, it shows actually that in Germany at the moment there's like a, a trend uh, for the German police that they want to get also access to this data. So basically, everything which we talk about now, um, like how to access uh, data or what kind of data is existing, is obviously also interesting for other parties. So you should keep that in mind. All right. So let's talk about the data which is on a device. Um, the actual data, the types of data which you have on a device is more or less depending on what kind of device you have, which is kind of, kind of obvious. However, um, all the IoT devices have one thing in common. They need Wi-Fi credentials to obviously connect to the Wi-Fi. They need some kind of cloud credentials to be able to connect to the cloud. And sometimes they create also like uh, cloud bindings that they kind of connect to a particular account. And as a rule of thumb, what I found is um, that the more performance functions or storage a device has, the more data it will store, no matter what. So log files, whatever. So let's take a look at particular devices or like particular types of devices. Um, if you have vacuum cleaners, and I got a lot of vacuum cleaners over the time, uh, also different models, um, most of the time what you find there is you have connection locks, for example, when the vacuum cleaner connected uh, to your Wi-Fi access point or when smartphones are provisioning the device for the first time. You have maps of your apartment, for example. You have cleaning locks. And um, <laughs> quite often you have also the user ID in there because you need to kind of create like a binding between the device and the user. If you take a um, look at other devices, for example, smart, uh, smart home gateways, which uh, connect different sensors, for, you, uh, for example, um, they again contain connection uh, log files. But in addition to that, they connect, uh, collect also uh, the sensor and uh, actuators, bindings, and uh, log files. So for example, if you open a door, um, most of the time, this device actually somewhere writes it in the log that it's received something from the sensor. Um, if you interconnect multiple devices, multiple gateways, then you can find also key material, which can give you like, also access to other devices. And again here, user IDs. Um, another thing which is kind of popular, especially like in the US, but I think it starts also like in, in Germany, are cameras and like the smart doorbell cameras. And some of the cameras are actually caching uh, snapshots or video clips. Um, you find sometimes also recorded video, which we store locally. We find uh, event logs, you find again um, user IDs. And the other thing in particular for cameras, which is special, is you might find the uh, cloud storage credentials where the camera is uploading its, cam uh, its video streams, for example. And sometimes it's also possible to access it again. One thing which is not directly smart home, but is also important are routers. And here the information which you can find, for example, is uh, the ACP leases, so you get like a, a binding between uh, MAC address, IP address, and timestamp, so you know like if someone 
was connecting with what kind of device uh, to, this, to this router. Some users um, do fiber configurations, so you find also the fiber configurations. If you have like a very um, powerful router, like the ABM routers which you have in Germany, um, you might also store media files there. And again, log files for connections, DNS um, queries, uh, filters, some parents filter uh, the internet traffic for their kids, and some other things. And uh, if you have, for example, like, um, um, like dynamic DNS, sometimes you find also the credentials there, and people tend to use the credentials also in other places. Um, media players are also very, very um, often used in homes. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most used devices. Um, again, here you find connection log files, you find media libraries, you find play playlists of like played movies, audios. Um, this device also cache a lot of content. And some of the devices, they run, for example, an Android operation system, they can contain also like a browser, so you might have like a browser history. And again, other credentials, for example, for Google Play Store, if it's an Android device, or um, network shares, if you have some kind of Kodi, which is connected to some uh, network attached storage. Um, there's one particular problem with this particular device, and um, I have, unfortunately, to, for ethical reasons, I have to skip this particular device, because I've got some devices which contain a lot of adult movies of a very special taste, and so I was told I should maybe not talk about that. Um, uh, last but not least, um, there's also like toys, um, and many people don't think that these devices can co contain also a lot of data. Configuration settings might be not that interesting, but uh, some devices can uh, collect audio and video streams or video data. And again, here you can also get like user usage logs, so you can figure out how often was this device used, at which points was the device used at which time. All right, so let's talk about how device uh, how data in general is stored on this um, IoT devices. Um, in general, um, you need to, obviously to, to use some storage, and um, the storage which is used on IoT devices you can more or less put in two groups. Um, one group is uh, the raw flash, which is um, sometimes known also in two like, subgroups like uh, serial flash, SPI, or uh, raw um, NAND flash, which is like connected parallel. And the other big group is our block devices. Um, in, in this case, it's eMMC, eMCP, or SD cards. And depending um, on the, cho uh, on the um, choice that the vendor made for like, using one or another, um, it affects also like, the um, selection of like, file systems later. So if you, you use one kind of, um, of um, storage type, then uh, it has multiple consequences for the, for the, for the other design um, choices of the device. So let's talk about uh, raw NAND flash. Um, there's one thing like SPI flash, and you find SPI flash usually uh, in typical sizes smaller than 64 megabytes. So if you, if you know like with your, your IoT device has less than 64 megabytes or 64 megabytes of flash, then it's most of the time SPI flash. It came in different packages, but it's kind of kind of easy. So it's always like uh, some something like eight, eight pins. Um, the other group, um, raw NAND, is typically coming in sizes between 128 megabytes up to 4 gigabytes. It can be also higher, but this is like more or less the typical one. And they come in bigger packages. So they have like um, typical packages like TSOP 48, which has 48 pins, or TSOP uh, 56, 56 pins, or also like some BGA variants. Um, the reason why this flash is used so often is basically because it's cheap and fast storage. On the other side, because it has bit errors all the time, you need to take care of some, some measurements. And in this particular case, it's so that your host processor and the operation system needs to take care of particular things. For example, wear leveling, ECC, um, error correction code, and bad block management. If you use Linux, um, that's more or less done by the MTD, the memory technology devices uh, subsystem, which takes care of like, the, um, all these kind of things. And what this uh, subsystem is basically doing is it takes the character device, which the NAND is, and converts it like in a block device, so you can access it like more easily. Um, in general, to, um, um, NAND has particular properties, and uh, one of the properties is that it's uh, organized in blocks and pages. Um, so a block contains multiple pages in this case, and if you want to erase um, like data, then you have to erase the whole block. This becomes important later. And the reason means basically you just set all the, zero, uh, all the, all the bits to one. Um, to give you like an idea how, how the sizes are between blocks and pages, uh, a typical block size is like between 16 and 512 kilobytes, and a typical page size is between like half a kilobyte uh, to uh, two kilobytes. Um, one of the things that you can do is basically you can do programming on a page level, but if you want to delete data, you have to do it in a block level. Um, this in addition to the actual data area, and this is called uh, out-of-band data, which is uh, there for uh, management or for ECC purposes. Um, because the vendors know that the Flash most of the time contains bad blocks, what they do is basically they, they add uh, additional spare blocks. So um, more than, I think like 2% of the blocks are more or less spare blocks. So if uh, you have like bad blocks, you can always replace them from there. And here, um, the 
error correction code is most of the time computed by the host CPU or the operation system. And the important information here is that the um, computation can be sometimes so, uh, vendor specific. So if you use a particular uh, chip, it can be um, completely different than if you use like another chip. So it's like vendor specific. All right. So let's talk about wear leveling for raw flash. And why, why do we do that? And the problem for, for NAND flash in particular is that the individual flash cells have like very limited um, lifetime for, for writes. So you can write to two flash cells maybe 1,000 times, and after that it's broken. And if you use file systems like X234 uh, um, on, um, on these on this devices, you can basically destroy or corrupt the data. Uh, because this, is, this file system is not um, wear leveling aware, or not flash aware even. Um, so what's the solution for that? The solution for that is that you use flash aware file systems, or like you put an additional layer into that. If you want to use like a flash aware file system, most of the time what you, what you use is like GEFs or GFFS2 or GFFS. Um, the alternative way would be you use like an additional layer between the flash and the operation system, which would be in this case UB or UB uh, in addition to UBFS. And these both things are, doing, are more or less taking care of the bad block management and the wear leveling, which is then happening in the operation system. So what's the general idea of this wear leveling? Well, you, um, if you delete data, then basically you don't delete the actual blocks, so you just mark it as like dirty. Um, and the information which you change is basically copied to your new block. And at some point, if you run out of space, for example, then the garbage collector will come through and uh, hopefully erase at some point this block. To demonstrate that in a very, very easy way, um, this is super simplified, it's way more complicated, but just to give you an idea of what's happening, you have a logical layer, uh, which is basically your data, and the physical layer where the data is more or less stored. And let's say we want to change this particular block. Uh, we want to change some information, by, for example, Wi-Fi credentials. Uh, then what happens is um, this block is read, um, then the information is changed in the memory and written to a new block, and then there's the new, created a new link to the new block, and the old block is marked as a dirty block. The problem here is the data is still present. So um, the data remains there until the garbage collector is coming through at some point. So for us, uh, to do forensic analysis on that, there's like a, some interesting properties. And one of the interesting properties is you might have multiple copies of, uh, of the data. Every time you change data, you have uh, you write it into a new block. And the old data is not erased as long uh, as the whole block is not erased. And the algorithms more or less try to avoid that as, as if it's possible. So the sizes of the copies which you have from like some files is typically bigger than two kilobytes. So you have like, multiple copies of a particular file which is bigger than two kilobytes. And if you change data more often, for example, log files or Wi-Fi credentials, if you change it like, often, then the more copies you have. Which means if you have Wi-Fi credentials, um, then at some point you have a history of all the Wi-Fi credentials. If you set up the device the first time, you, you use like one password. When you figured out, oh, it might be not a good idea to to connect this device to like your secure Wi-Fi, and you create a new IoT Wi-Fi, you, you change the credentials in this device, but it still remembers the old ones. Um, there's some rec recommended material about this whole topic, um, which I don't want to go too deep into that. There's a Black Hat, uh, Black Hat talk from 2014 about reverse engineering flash memory for fun and benefit. Uh, by Matt O, and he gives like a short introduction about the um, communication protocol which is NAND using. Um, he gives some tips about soldering, unsoldering of NAND flash, and in particular how to reverse engineer raw NAND formats. So I put the links there. And another, uh, there's another article, like a blog article, uh, from NAND chips to files, uh, from John Ma Michael Pico, and uh, also there's the link. As a side note about this, this flash stuff, um, basically uh, even vendors are not uh, aware of these uh, properties, for example, for JFS2. I have here an example from my talk from the DEF CON 26 last year, where the um, vendors actually forgot their developer credentials in the uh, JFS2 image, which we copied on millions of devices. So the space was still this, this history available, and the vendors didn't delete that. So um, if you can delete it, then the vendor can, um, then also vendors forget about bad things. Let's talk about the second group, uh, the block devices. And these block devices are mostly known as management NAND. There's different standards, like there's EMC4 standards, uh, EMC5 standards. Depends on the standard, it has some additional features. In general, there's like a, a distinction between EMMC and EMCP. EMMC itself is just flash with an integrated controller. So you have the raw NAND flash, and you have an additional controller, and this is in one chip. And the typical size, uh, or the typical packages which you find there is like FPGA 153. Um, in contrast to that, EMCP is more or less the same like an EMMC, but it has also additional DRAM on the chip. And the advantage why a lot of vendors are using this particular um, package is basically we have only one chip, um, which contains RAM and flash in on, on, on one device, and that makes it way easier to 
um, for the supply chain, for example, and the typical packages which you find there is FPGA 162 and 221. Um, if you look under Linux on these devices, then basically you see them as uh, normal uh, block storage devices which support fully like X2, X3, X4. And um, the chips itself, they take care of the wear leveling, ECC, bad block management. So you have like a layer inside of the chip which is taking care of that and the operation system has no idea about that. So the big question is, well, how we can access deleted data on, on, on this chip? And uh, usually the eMMC controller doesn't allow you raw access for this data. As soon as it's deleted, some um, eMMCs um, even support like trim commands, so we just delete whole blocks of data. However, the thing here is again, the eMMC um, are using raw NAND internally. And if you somehow can bypass the eMMC controller and directly attach to the NAND, then you can access the data again. The only challenge then is basically you have to understand what kind of uh, data format the, the MMC controller um, has used. There's a very recommended talk up there um, about EMMC chips, data recovery beyond the controller from a um, um, forensics uh, um, company called Rasult. And basically their, their summary is that uh, even if the EMMC, control, uh, EMMC chip is completely erased from the operation system and wiped, the data is still present on, on the NAND flash. Uh, but this, this is a little bit out of scope probably for, the, for, for most people. Okay, let's talk about the typical reset states which you would find if you get some used device in your hand. Well, the, most of the time the reset state is more, more or less dependent on the previous owner. So it depends on what the previous owner did or knew or uh, wasn't able to do. Um, a lot of times you find devices which are not reset at all. So basically they, had, they contained all the um, device information, um, they contained all the data, they contained uh, the configuration, everything. And the most probable cause here is, for example, that uh, there's like knowledge missing at the user how to erase actually data or that the device was broken. I, last week I, I, ordered, uh, I bought uh, like five Amazon Echo Dots um, where the USB connectors were broken and I just restored the connectors and the devices were still like uh, provisioned. So um, that's one of the cases which can happen. The other case which can happen is um, that the, the device was Wi-Fi resetted, so that uh, the Wi-Fi information was deleted, but the device still contains all the data. And um, many devices only support this one particular mode. So if you find a device which has a reset button and you press the reset button, most of the time what it does is only Wi-Fi reset. So it doesn't delete the data really inside of it. Um, the third kind of case what can happen is like that the device was wiped. Um, if the device, for example, um, supported some kind of um, uh, factory set where it just wipes all the information and resets the uh, factory state of the firmware, then that's a potentially good thing. However, even in this case, there might be still um, traces of data available on the device. And even not all devices support this, this kind of thing. Um, to summarize more or less both reset types, um, there, there are some, actually some devices which support both things. So um, if you do a Wi-Fi reset, there's usually like a particular marker for the Wi-Fi reset where you press the button and you can, uh, you can do that. Um, and the device wipe you have usually initiated by a special button combination or you have to do it all by the app. The general idea why the vendors don't do all the time a device wipe is the, is, is the following. Well, every time, let's say, you want as, an, as a user to reconnect the device to a new Wi-Fi, you want to change the Wi-Fi credentials or whatever, you don't want to erase the whole configuration of this device. So basically, if you press the button, it must be available directly so that you can reprovision that again. So, um, and you want also to have the most, most of the settings still remain. In contrast to that, the device web should just delete everything, which is maybe not the most favorable, favorable um, kind of outcome for, for users if they want to reuse their devices themselves all the time. All right, so let's talk about uh, data extraction methods. Um, the main idea of data extraction methods, obviously for IoT devices, uh, is, is to extract all available data which we can get from the device. And there are more or less like three groups of methods which you can use. You can try to uh, access the data by a software, for example, if you get root access. Um, you can dump the data um, from the flash without the soldering, which is probably the most favorable thing for most people, um, because otherwise you can still be dangerous. Or you can dump the flash contents by desoldering the chip, which is also called the uh, chip off method. Um, for the software method, for many devices, even for, for like particular versions of the Amazon Echo Dot, uh, there are like routing methods available publicly. So you just, for example, install like a custom firmware, uh, you ex or you access the device um, over USB or UART, and then you just dump the whole data. Um, some devices also, especially like cameras, they have like a special, um, if you put a special file on the SD card, then it boots like an um, operation system from the external media. So you can use that to boot like your own system. And then as soon as you have access to, to a shell on the system, you just use DD to copy all the information for the flash. One particular thing where you want to use DD and not like NAND dump or something, um, because DD is not aware of flash, it will just copy everything. 
uh, which is exactly the use case which we want. We want to get all the data, including the out-of-band information, um, and this is very useful for our case. Um, and one way to extract like data um, from the device is, for example, use like external media. If you have another SD card, or if you use the same SD card, or you can use SSH or NetCat. This method works great, especially for uh, systems with JFFS2 or UBFS file system. Um, the disadvantage here is it depends a little bit on the kernel, what kind of interface the kernel gives you. So um, the low-level access on the flash might be potentially limited, but most of the time it, it works, very uh, works pretty fine. Um, so the next thing which you would do if you can't access um, like over the, the flash over, over software would be to try to dump the firmware without disordering. And this works um, great for SPI flash or MMC flash, and it would kind of requires that the device allows in-system programming. So uh, one thing which you do is like basically you follow the traces and you figure out where the um, where you can access the flash uh, data lines uh, over test pins, and you need to make sure somehow that the processor is not interfering with that process. Um, one thing which you can do is you just ground, for example, the crystal, or you pull down the um, reset pin of the processor. So you just need to somehow the processor to stop. The advantage here is obviously, well, if you don't disorder BGI chips, then you, it's, it's, you have a very reduced risk of destroying the actual hardware. Um, the disadvantage is here, you need to f figure out where the test pins are and you need to somehow stop the, uh, the processor. Especially like if you have like, um, PCBs with four layers where the data lines sometimes are in between the layers, it, it gets a little more difficult. Um, the last method is obviously disordering the chip, and this works literally for all the flash chips. And one thing which you want to do about disordering is this should mean, shouldn't be like a disordering session, but uh, in general you want to preheat the whole PCB, because most of the time you have like a huge ground plane, and if you don't do that, then you will just pull the pins. Um, if you have uh, devices with uh, like flash chips with uh, accessible pins, what you can do is like you can try to create like a low temperature alloy of the soldering. So you just use like a 130 degrees Celsius uh, soldering paste and then just mix it with the existing soldering paste, which makes it easier to remove the chip. For BGA chips, well, unfortunately, you need like hot air, infrared, or reflow soldering stations. Um, you cannot use like a usual soldering iron for that. Well, the disadvantage in general, if you disorder uh, BGI chips, you, if you want to reuse the device at some point again, then you need to reball the devices and uh, reball the chip, which requires additional tools. Um, and if you um, disorder like a NAND flash, then to read it out, you need a particular special adapter to, uh, because of the pin count. You cannot just connect it to normal devices. Um, so let's talk about the tools in general. What, what kind of tools do you need? Um, if you want to read SPI flash, you can literally use any device which supports any kind of bit banging on GPIOs. You can use a Raspberry Pi, you can, you can use an Arduino, uh, you can use a, a bus pirate. Um, one tool which I use is like Flashcat USB because I use it also for, for, for some, some other stuff where you can just um, use like an adapter, you put the, the chip in and you can read it out. Um, for EMMCs, it's, it's similar simple, um, even though but you have to be a little bit careful about EMMC um, um, low so EMMC is with lower voltage, so before you do apply any power to it, you should read the data sheet if it requires, for example, 1.8 volt. And um, there are some very, very cheap methods, for example, there's the expertise um, EMMC adapter for $10, uh, where you can just um, sort of the um, cables to the, lines, the data lines of the chip, for example, and connect it to the SD card reader, and you can just dump the, um, most of the content. The difficulty here is if you have BGA chips, obviously you need to have very good eyes or you need to have a microscope. And um, if you use an SD card adapter, then most of the time you don't have access to all partitions, which doesn't really matter for us um, because you need like, to use a special protocol to access the boot partitions. So, but because we want only to get the user data, we don't care too much about that. Um, there are also some cheap Chinese tools available for that, which uh, many, many smartphone repair shops are using. So there's like the uh, UFI box light where you have like multiple adapters for BGA chips. And what you do is like basically you put the BGA chips on that and you close the, the lid and it has some small needles which are connecting everything for you. And this kind of device also supports, supports uh, dual voltage. Um, it has some disadvantages because um, you need to find the correct position where to place the BG BGA. And one thing which you shouldn't use is actually the Windows software of, of this particular product because it's detected as malware and the typical recommendation by the vendor is like, yeah, it's fine, it's because of our security technology, so just deactivate your virus scanner. Uh, maybe you shouldn't use that. Um, for run end, it gets a little bit more complicated because we have like a, um, you need to connect a um, lot of pins for that. And um, also this kind of device usually requires some sort of NAND controller. 
And again here, there's this other talk, um, which I can recommend, the uh, reverse engineering flash memory for fun and benefit. If you want to use an adapter for that, well, um, there's again the flash cut thing where you can um, buy like a particular adapter where you can even read PGA chips. And this device supports more, like lots of um, different kinds of uh, flash devices. However, the important thing here is um, because the ECC and out of band data is dependent on the on the SOC which you use, um, it doesn't really interpret that uh, for you. But it doesn't really matter for us if you want to extract the data, but it might ma matter for you if you want to do some reverse engineering of these devices. Uh, another method, uh, which is sometimes possible, is um, you just get your um, um, development kit for this one particular uh, um, CPU which you have, for example, on the device. And the idea here is you just take the um, chip which you just uh, removed from the upper board and you just solder it on, and then you should be able to access it directly. The uh, disadvantage here is um, you cannot always buy these development boards um, for all the chips which are available, um, and the other thing is they sometimes they are very expensive, so it's kind of like... If you have access to that, then it might be an option, but usually you don't. So if, if you have to dump at some point, then you can use the typical thing which many, many people for reverse engineering use is obviously bin walk. You just run bin walk and it will detect like, many partitions or some data. You can use also like a normal hex editor to just find, like if you're look, looking for Wi-Fi credentials, you just look for SSID and you find all the time something. Um, if you want to further disassemble, um, um, NAND dumps, when there's some tools available, um, like the dump flash tool uh, from Matt O, there's the NAND dump tool. Um, but in general, the problem with this kind of tools is that they're sometimes exotic, uh, exotic out of band sizes um, or ECC data which are not um, working for these particular tools. If you at some point has like, have like a, a UBFS image, there's like UBFS dumper. If you have like JFFS2, there's Jefferson, which is also most of the time I think used by bin, Binwalk. So you can, you have a lot of tools available which you can use to, to analyze these dumps. Okay, so let's start with some um, example uh, devices which are analyzed uh, to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, the typical method what I use is I disassemble the devices, I uh, dump the flash, for example, by unsoldering or just in, in system programming. Um, then later on, I resolder the flash again, I power it on the device, I root the device if possible. And uh, at some point, I also try to, con to connect the um, device again to the app or to the original, like um, if it uses a particular app, just to connect it to like, my own account. Um, and to get like an idea of what's happening, if you reset the device, I reset it and um, was just comparing between uh, the data which was available before the reset and which was available after the reset. So the first device which I have is uh, the Ecovax uh, D-Bot 900, um, which is, I think, kind of popular in Germany right now. Um, I got this device in 2019, and the previous owner told me that it was resetted, actually. And this kind of uh, device uses like Linux platform. Um, we use a Rockchip uh, quad-core, ARM quad-core, which is uh, kind of interesting for a vacuum cleaner again. Um, they're using uh, raw NAND flash, 128 megabyte, and this device has also like 128 megabyte of DDR RAM. Um, what I did here is basically I unsolded the, 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 uh, the NAND flash and um, um, dumped it and then tr tr tried later on to connect over UART. Um, after I dumped the flash, there was some information which I found. I wanted to verify that this device was actually factory set and that I don't like um, that the vendor didn't have the idea what he did. And one thing which I found is, for example, I found the actual log file which said at this point, when before I got the device, that this device was factory set complete. Um, I found also like a lo lot of other fragments about log files, key maps, um, and even Wi-Fi credentials. In this particular case, what you see there is um, in, in the bottom um, the log files of uh, the usage of the brushes of the device. Um, the particular problem what I had with this device is I didn't knew, knew what kind of out-of-band um, computation they use or how the out-of-band data is kind of um, built. So I couldn't really reassemble the image again. Um, next step, what I did is like I connected to a UART, which is unfortunately, they closed it down so it's only read-only, but it have given me like a lot of uh, useful information. For example, I know that uh, Rockchip is using a very particular, uh, very specific NAND driver for their, um, for their devices, and it does like custom wear leveling, so it doesn't use the wear leveling of Linux. And they use SquatchFS for the root partition and X4 for the data partition. Uh, speaking of credentials, um, like I mentioned earlier, you find like a history of credentials, and what you see here on, uh, on the right side is basically um, in the beginning, the factory settings were only with the factory Wi-Fi of the, of the vendor. Like it was like Ecovax uh, underscore factory. And at some point, the vendor started to add more and more uh, Wi-Fi credentials to this device to connect it to the home Wi-Fi. So at some point, I had like two um, different credentials for the Wi-Fi. Um, another interesting file was the connection log file. 
which uh, told me um, some information about the user, for example, when this device was connected to the Wi-Fi, um, or for example, which kind of device was used to initially provision it. For example, the owner, the previous owner, had a Samsung Galaxy phone, where which was used to, to provision that. Now the question is, can we figure out where the user is living or where the, the user is coming from? And one thing which you potentially can use, and what, is your, what your smartphone is doing all the time, you can use the Google Geolocation API. And the input for this Geolocation API is basically you give it two MAC addresses and a signal strength which you receive, and it will give you back like a location um, with some accuracy rating. The problem for this particular device is I found in the log file only one MAC address, uh, so I couldn't use that, so it was a little bit sad. However, there's another um, search engine where you can look for SSIDs, and the particular SSIDs which have been used there uh, where um, some kind of device specific uh, from the vendor uh, from the um, from O2. So we have like some random string at the end, and um, basically just run it against the search engine and found like um, for both Wi-Fi's exactly the same position, um, which was kind of useful. So as a summary for this one particular device, well, most of the user data was still existing on the device. You could see the XMMP network logs because this device is using XMMP for controlling. Uh, you can see the maps. Uh, you can see credentials. Um, however, I couldn't really extract the map uh, format or the maps uh, because I didn't figure out how the map uh, format is, um, to, what I have to do to reassemble it. Um, later on, I tried to um, reset the device three times with the factory reset, which was in the manual, and the data fragments were still there. Um, one interesting aspect also, I found the factory logs of the devices, uh, of, of, of this device, so I could see what kind of uh, tests we did in the factory, what kind of Wi Fi we used in the factory, what kind of, so I could see everything when, when this device was actually born. Um, and with this method um, of the log files, I could also track down the uh, previous owner. The good news in this case was that the app didn't leak the previous maps. So if you connect it like, um, to, um, to the app, it doesn't show you like, the cl previous cleaning logs. Um, the, and this particular like, behavior is also like, that the data is still there. It's not, not only for this one particular vendor. So I found it like, for multiple other vendors. For example, there's like Biomi Vacuum Cleaner uh, Robot version 2, which is exact, have exactly the same hardware more or less. All right. Um, the next device which I found were um, from 2018. Um, it was in an unclear condition because it has water damage. And uh, the Xiaomi Vacuum Cleaners um, run Ubuntu 14.04. They have like a quad-core Alwinner R16 processor, and they use eMMC before Gigabyte for the flash. And this device has also 512 megabytes to give you just an idea um, um, how powerful this device is. And what I did here is basically because I rooted this kind of device like a long, long time ago, um, I um, dumped the partitions over UART and connected uh, the device later on to, to the cloud. The good thing for this device was that the routing method exists because I found it like two years ago on the Chaos Communication Congress. Um, so you can get a root shell over UART or if you just push like a custom firmware. Um, you can then, if you have like the root access, you can just extract all the data over SSH. And this is a great method um, to avoid removing the EMMC flash, which is PGA. It's not that nice. If you take a look at the EMMC layout of the, of the device, there's, um, you, you will see that the operation system is existing in multiple copies. But we are not caring, in this case, too much about the operation system. We're caring about this one partition, which is at the end, uh, the UDISC, which contains all the user data. So we're interested in this one particular one. So. One, one interesting thing about this device is it supports both Wi-Fi reset and factory reset. And uh, if you do the Wi-Fi reset, then only the Wi-Fi credential file is deleted. However, if you do the factory reset, it requires a very specific, um, specific procedure where you have to press three buttons at the same time. It's mentioned somewhere in the manual, but how many people are actually reading the manual? Um, what this factory reset is basically doing is it restores all the operation uh, system uh, from um, recovery, and it formats also the data partition. However, it doesn't wipe it, so it's just to like a, a MKFS um, X3, I think. X4, sorry. Um, also, another thing is the usage data. So, how much, how often this vacuum cleaner was used? How is the, uh, how the, how many hours, and how, how, what kind of area this vacuum cleaner did clean? It's not erased at all times, so it's basically still there. So what kind, of, what kind of information I found for this one particular broken vacuum cleaner which I bought out of eBay? Well, I figured out after I provisioned it with a new account that um, the previous data is still visible in the app. So I could get all the, the cleaning records. I could see the map of, the, of, of, the, of this person's apartment. I could go down, I could go back to, I think, um, yeah. So for, for a long time, I could see all the kind of runs, 68 runs in total. Um, one thing which I figured out is that the data is re-uploaded uh, re to the cloud. So even if you reset the device and at some point change the user, it's the vacuum cleaner will happily re-upload everything again to the cloud. And you can access the log files locally on the device. 
Um, one good thing is if you do the factor reset properly with a special uh, button combination, then at least you can't see the map files anymore, but they're still there somewhere. Um, so here I tried again, uh, again to locate the former owner, and the good thing here is that when I was looking in the log files, I actually found two MAC addresses of the Wi-Fi access points because the owner had like uh, two Wi-Fi access points in his house apparently, and you could see like in the log files two MAC addresses. And here the Google geolocation API returned actually the core coordinates, and um, it was somewhere in, uh, in Hanau, in, in Germany. Um, interestingly, after I did that, I figured out that uh, the Wi-Fi credentials actually reveal part of the address. So there was like the house number and like some part of the uh, street name in the in the um, in the Wi-Fi credentials, and also the person apparently used some personal information for the Wi-Fi password. Um, one cool thing which you can do is if you have, have the user ID um, and you find the user ID in one of the files, um, then you can search the user ID in your um, smart home uh, app, and um, then you um, can just, for example, tr try to um, reveal the user's name at some point, which is kind of nice. So you just enter like the user ID, and then shows you like the profile picture and the, uh, the name, and asks you if, you, for example, want to share a device with him. And this is kind of kind of interesting. So as a summary for this particular device, well. All the data was still available because the user didn't reset it, probably because it was broken. The data was wiped instead. Um, Wi-Fi wi wi reset was done, maybe done at some point. Um, the reset button on this particular device is a little bit misleading. So if you press reset, basically it does only Wi-Fi reset, not the factory reset. Um, however, the procedure in this case is do documented in the manual, but again, not many people read that. And with this information which I had, uh, is I could track down the previous owner due to the log files. And this device also creates a lot of log files, so you find always something. Um, one example from um, for for like toys, um, like a very short example. Um, I have like small small uh, small drones which I bought, and I have also some some new ones. And this children toy is basically a very powerful device. So this, this is like a fifty dollar device, I think. It's like super small, and it runs Android. It has like I think um, quad core, I believe, with four gigabyte um, EMMC memory and a five hundred twelve megabyte of RAM. The cool thing about that is it has two cameras, for, one for navigation and the other one for like video recording. And this kind of device you can access over a serial if you connect the uh, UART data lines or over ADB after you rooted it. I have like a custom frame of it. And here the thing is, this device records, um, um, stores the recorded videos which you can record with this device on internal memory. And obviously if, you, if your kids play with this kind of device and crash it to the next wall and destroy the device, then you have no chance to delete this data. Uh, even deleting this data, if, it, if the device is working, it's still very difficult. To give an idea of what kind of images it looks like, so this is like just a picture which I make in the lab, so I was flying around and this device was recording. Um, again, it's central to data, the actual original data which was on the device because it might be a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> Um, another quick example, doorbells. Um, there's many, many uh, models which are used, maybe uh, most of the time use exactly the same design. It's like HI-3518. Um, this device is usually have SBI flash with something of 8 megabyte. And these devices also use uh, JFS2 or UBFS. Again, you can extract all the uh, buffer credentials. The sad part of the, about this particular doorbells, which I found, where um, they, you, you can usually insert a SD card, which is then used for storage of the video. So I didn't really found video data on it because it usually uses um, external SD cards. Um, however, not everything is bad, actually. So I found like one particular vacuum cleaning model, which I'm rooting right now, which I don't want to disclose yet, um, which does this a little bit different. We use trust, trust zone for the key storage. So basically, all the user partitions are encrypted with looks. And um, um, the uh, keys are uh, um, um, managed by the trust execution engine and are device specific. And every time this device is boot, um, it basically unlocks the configuration of the user data. One interesting thing about the factory set is basically just deletes the key and recreate uh, the partition, which is, I think, typically the best practice how you would handle that kind of situation. So it doesn't mean that everything is totally bad, but some people know about the risks. As a conclusion, um, well, the device remembers, right? So you have like a history of Wi-Fi credentials. You can't be sure as soon as you provision something on the device that it will be gone at some point. And a secure and correct factory reset is very difficult to implement. If you use NAND flash in particular, like if you use raw NAND flash, then a full wipe is like very, very difficult. And you have no way to ensure that the device has been corrected wiped, uh, correctly wiped. Um, also, n many vendors uh, actually do not release uh, user-generated data. So you have the usage data which remains, you have log files which remain on the device. Um, if you do a Wi-Fi reset, the Wi-Fi configuration might be over overwritten, but you can find the same configuration in many other places, like log files. And th th one of the biggest problems is still the missing knowledge of the user. So if users are not aware that they have actually to wipe the devices, uh, or that this device might contain data, 
um, then we have a big problem. So as recommendations, well, do not sell or throw away your devices, um, especially if you expect that it might contain some sensitive information. And especially also if you cannot verify that you have done a full wipe. Um, try to physically destroy the, the device. And uh, for example, if you have like a broken device, well, um, if it's broken, why not break it more, right? So just disassemble it, try to um, just practice a little bit of soldering. Um, the other thing is, um, use for your IoT devices a separate Wi-Fi. If some, some of your neighbors, for example, have your Wi-Fi credentials, they can access your network, obviously. If you use a separate IoT uh, network, then it's a little bit more difficult. However, it doesn't prevent leakage. It's still like um, the attacker might have limited access to your, to your network, but still they might have access. All right, uh, that's more or less um, nearly the end of my presentation. I want to thank a few people who uh, supported me to do that research, uh, Professor Nabir and uh, Professor Manfidelli from uh, the Northeastern University. But I also want to uh, thank um, the Zemo Labs at the TU Darmstadt uh, for supporting me in my master thesis. And now I'm happy, happily here for any further questions. And uh, yeah, any further questions. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. I think we have uh, time for a few quick questions. There's a microphone angel over there, so signal him or just walk over to him. I can't see very well, so you have to make eye contact with him. There's a question right behind you. Microphone. Oh, okay. Sorry. You go first. Uh, My mic is on. Uh, uh, you mentioned one device that has uh, that did it pro properly, securely. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us which device was this, and if there do you have a list of devices that do this good, this properly? Um, well, for this one particular vacuum cleaner, I can't tell you yet because I'm at the moment in the routing process, and at some point I want to publish that, and I don't want to you know, scare the vendor yet so that they do changes which prevent me from doing that. Um, but there are devices out there which, which obviously do that. It's um, not trivial to find and uh, the other problem is also that the vendors actually not kind of, you know, advertise the feature that it does some kind of secure um, um, factory reset. Um, in general, like, um, devices which do it very good are like obviously smartphones because they learned out of the history. Um, but other, other, other from that, it's like um, I'm uh, I can't think too much about devices which... Um, so there are not many devices out there which do it correctly. Unfortunately, I can't give you too much information about that. <laughs> okay, one over there. Uh, uh, can you give a sort of sliding scale on what would be... I, I have to ship an IoT device, and I'm trying to figure out where the... What, what would be the... Sorry. Can you give a sliding scale of what should and should not be implemented in sort of in data cleaning process, that kind of thing? Um, well, as a vendor, what you can do at some point is um, that you can just start in the beginning and just not collecting log files at all. I mean, this would be, like, would be helpful for a lot of things. Um, in general, Wi-Fi credentials are always like a sensitive thing because they have to be at some point in plain text uh, if you want to connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, but there's also like methods, for example, where you um, can encrypt them or like put them in hardware somewhere like there's like trust zone which you can use for that but not all devices obviously support trust zone was that like a good question to you uh, but that was wait so did it answer your question <laughs> thank you close enough okay okay there that that was a question okay <laughs> is it, yeah. Besides destroying and not buying it, um, is there any best practice that you could recommend for a typical user that is not into uh, deeper uh, IT knowledge, how to handle uh, such a device after usage? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficult question. So the thing is, um, I had a discussion earlier today with someone who said, like, yeah, well, I mean, you cannot just destroy any device which you have, like smart TVs and everything, because it's like, from the, uh, you know, um, 
from the eco economical perspective and um, from the environmental perspective, it's not a, not a good thing. However, if you have the idea that your device is like has contains some some information, that it's, if it's a very very cheap device, for example, like a media box for thirty dollars, and just take a hammer and you know hammer it down, it's the same thing. If you have like a broken hard drive, right? It's like uh, broken hard drives. The typical recommendation is if you if it doesn't run anymore, if you can't wipe it, then just open it and drill some holes into it. It's just destroyed somehow physically. Um, I know it. Many people won't do that for like a expensive TV, but um, it's it's a very it's a hard to answer question because it's um, it's 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 such a huge problem, and I can't imagine like a good solution for it at the moment, to be honest. Thank you. Over there. Um, in Mr. Robot, we see Elio destroying chips uh, with the microwave. Is this a good way, or what would be a good way to destroy flash chips? <laughs> um, I, I think from, uh, from microwaving passports, we know that it can, it can sometimes cause a fire, so I wouldn't recommend to, to microwave uh, flash chips or like chips at all. Um, I, I I think usually breaking them somehow, like I mean, if even if you if you have a like for example an SD card and you break it in two parts, we have people who can reassemble the two parts and can still read all the data. But the question is like, um, how important are you that people are actually trying that? Um, so I think it's totally fine if you just like I don't know like um, physically with a screwdriver just remove the flash chip and throw it away somewhere, and if, if no one can find the chip, that should be fine. Or if you just break it. Um, Depends. Depends if your CIA wants to get any, any information from you. So, uh, so what's your what's your enemy? <laughs> so we are slowly but steadily running out of time. So uh, let's thank Dennis again for his talk.